Welcome to She Oak and Sunlight, Australian Impressionism, a major exhibition of around 270 Impressionist works from the collection of the National Gallery of Victoria, as well as many other collections around Australia. I'm Angela Hessen, I'm Curator of Australian Art at the NGV, and I'm going to be joined today by Dr Anna Gray, who is our guest curator for the exhibition, and Sophie Girard, who is our Assistant Curator of Australian Art here at the NGV. I'd like to begin our tour today by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which this exhibition is held, the Wurundjeri and the Bunwurrung people of the Kulin Nation, and I would like to pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. I would also like to thank our many lenders to this exhibition, in particular the National Gallery of Australia, the Art Gallery of New South Wales and the Art Gallery of South Australia. The breadth and diversity of their loans has enabled the enormously rich content of this exhibition. I'm Anna Gray. I'm one of the curators of this exhibition. Behind me is a wall of portraits of a number of the artists who are included in this exhibition. Of course, you'll know the best known Australian Impressionists, Roberts, McCubbin, Conda and Streeton, and their portraits are on the wall. In fact, there's several portraits of them by various artists. There's also portraits of E. Phillips Fox and his students at Chartersville. When you move from this room, you will go into a number of plein air rooms where you'll see how these artists changed over time. You initially, you see Roberts working with McCubbin. They were very good friends. They had met at the art school and they remained friends all their lives, but not always painting together. But at Box Hill and at Mentone, they painted together. And what's very interesting about the Box Hill works is that they went into the landscape. They went right into the landscape. And unlike earlier colonial artists, who had painted panoramic views of Australian landscape. They played, painted close up views, capturing the feel of the bush, the crickle of the grasses against them, the feel as you touched the twigs on the ground. And you can sense this in their paintings. Roberts painted a couple who had had a summer morning's tiff. But in the painting, there's a robin. And the robin suggests that perhaps the tiff was going to end. McCubbin painted a very well-known work called Lost. Again, a storytelling picture, but a picture which had a happy ending because the lost girl was eventually found by her mother and returned to her. On the opposite wall, you see pictures of Mentone. And again, these are innovative works. We think it's common these days for artists to paint the sea, but it was very, very new as a subject at this time. These are some of the first paintings of the sea in Australia. It's something that the French Impressionists also painted for the first time. And so the Australian artists are mirroring, in a way, what the French Impressionists were doing. When you move into Egremont, you see a different combination of artists. No longer is it Roberts and McCubbin. Now, the majority of the works are by Condor and Streeton. Streeton took a train and went to Egremont and was given permission to live in the house on the Mount Eagle estate. And there, he and Conda camped for a number of years. Streeton had met Roberts and McCubbin at Mentone and became part of the group. And then Conda moved from Sydney to Melbourne. And when Streeton got permission to stay in the house at Mount Eagle Estate, Conda joined him there and they painted pictures together, often in competition with each other sometimes painting the same subject, but painting it in a different way. And their personality can be seen in their different paintings. In one painting, 
Streeton is concentrating on the sky and on the realistic depiction of the subject. Condor adds a whim element of whimsy to his picture and an element of humour. And this you can find throughout their works, the difference in their personalities, just as you can see the difference in the personalities between McCubbin and Roberts. Although the majority of works in this exhibition can be characterised stylistically as impressionist, another important influence on the art of this period was the symbolist movement, which came to a peak around the turn of the 19th century, that enormously generous and meaningful period in art and culture in which ideas of transformation and metamorphosis occupied the public imagination. One of the key works that uh, characterizes some of the qualities of this movement is Condor's Hot Wind, patent in 1888 to 89. This was a period of drought in Victoria, and it had caused enormous anxiety and fear amongst the population. And here we see the drought characterized as the figure of the femme fatale. Here, a kind of sphinx-like figure crawling across a parched, barren landscape and blowing across a brazier, sending the hot wind out across the landscape. The figure of the femme fatale was a very meaningful one around this period. We have to remember, of course, that this was a period that saw great changes in understandings about gender and sexuality. The role of women in particular had come to be questioned around the turn of the century with the birth of the suffrage movement and also increases in women's rights across all areas of life. And the femme fatale is often understood as a manifestation of anxiety around this changing role of women. Condor here creates a wonderfully evocative, magical image which encapsulates simultaneously environmental anxieties and also the mingled excitement and fear around the changing aspect of gender and sexuality in society. The pamphlet that accompanied the seminal 9x5 exhibition in 1889 was illustrated by Charles Condor. And this also exemplified many of the symbolist ideas that I've been discussing. The pamphlet shows the figure of a woman from whom a series of lengthy bindings are being unwrapped. The bindings are helpfully labelled convention, lest that metaphor be lost. There is the idea here of the figure of creativity being literally unbound from the constraints of convention and expectation. Included in this image also are a number of other iconographic elements, including the smoking torch recently extinguished, a flowering branch, and the rising or setting sun. All of these are emblems for transformation, metamorphosis, and creativity being reborn. The use of this sketch to illustrate the 9 by 5 exhibition was no accident. This exhibition was a pioneering moment for the Impressionist movement in Australia. It functioned perhaps as their manifesto, as the expression, the culmination of all of their ideas about what was most revolutionary and what was most exciting about Impressionism in Australia. Here we see the humble sketch on a small scale elevated to the realm of high art. And with that, the abandonment of all of the convention that had previously constrained much of the academic tradition. When we move into the 9 by 5 room, the paintings were mostly on wooden panels, 9 inches by 5 inches, on cigar boxes. Well, mostly on cigar boxes, sometimes on wood panels. And Roberts wanted the artists to join with him in this venture. And they called themselves for the first time Impressionists. This is when they really become Impressionists. They try to capture the moment of day, the moment of season, the weather, and they also have poetic titles and sometimes musical titles like you see in the works of Whistler. Because when he was in London, studying at the Royal Academy, Roberts had probably seen an exhibition by Whistler of small panels, and this inspired him. And the critics who looked at this exhibition compared their works with the French Impressionists, but also with Whistler. And the comparison with the French Impressionists was that they both were interested in times of day 
working on plein air, capturing moments. But it was also that they were creating a success to scandal, that they were revolutionaries. And the critics picked this up. Another exciting opportunity afforded by this exhibition was to consider some lesser known artists working in less conventional media. Among these are Victorian born artist Mae Vale, who spent much of her life living and studying overseas. Included in the exhibition here, you can see a selection of her timber samples, which she produced in the 1880s in collaboration with renowned botanist Ferdinand von Müller. These are owned by Museums Victoria and offer an extraordinary document of May Vale's proficiency as a botanical illustrator. She was to go on to produce pioneering impressionist works across media. In the same section, you can see two exquisite frame drawings by Lily Williamson. Williamson was trained as an artist, but went on to become a picture framer, specializing in extraordinarily skilled carving technique. Later in her life, she married Tom Roberts, and we are fortunate to have a couple of examples of her frames in the collection, though sadly they date to a later period than that that we could include in this exhibition. When we move on through the exhibition, we come to a room where you see Streeton and Roberts together. It's really not a room, but a corridor. And in this room, you see Streeton and Roberts in Sydney. In 1890, Melbourne became no longer marvellous Melbourne, but went into an economic depression and Streeton and Roberts escaped from Melbourne to Sydney. And there Streeton repainted some of his most famous subjects, the Sydney Harbour. And Roberts became known for as a famous painter of portraits. And you can see some wonderful portraits painted by Roberts. And Streeton made his own subject of industrial revolution what was happening in the city, capturing Redfern Station, the trains, and also Fireman's Funeral, looking down on the subject, as Roberts had done very much earlier in his painting of Burke Street, Allegro con Brio. So the influence of Roberts comes onto Streeton and is visible in these works in Sydney. So here we are in the far mistier twilight realm of Chartersville, and you'll notice a contrast, I think, from the sun-drenched landscapes of Eaglemont that we saw earlier in the exhibition. Chartersville was an old homestead situated on rising land above the Yarra that was occupied by a series of artists in the 1890s, first by Walter Withers, and later by Tudor St. George Tucker and E. Phillips Fox, who ran the art school there. Many of their students shared their interest in representing subtle atmospheric effects, the shifting moments of day, twilight and early morning that offered the opportunity to capture subtle fleeting effects in nature. Among their students were well-known figures, including Clara Southern and Jane Sutherland, who produced some of the well-known works in our collection, including the old bee farm, Warrandite, and field naturalists. We're also excited in this room to include several smaller scale works, among these ones that have been recently acquired for the collection, including works by Ina Gregory and Jane Price. Gregory and Price had an important friendship and lived together at the end of their lives. Their works convey a subtle and intimate knowledge of landscape, often painted on a smaller scale, and they represent also their interest in the spiritual relationship between art and nature. Both were founding members of the Theosophical Society and had a long-term interest in elevating the standing of women painters at their time. We're delighted to have been able to recently add their works to the collection. Streeton decided he must follow Conda to Europe. Conda had left them in about 1890 when they went to Sydney and gone to Europe and had made friends there and Streeton was very keen to join him. But when he got there, he found that Conda had made many friends. And then their god, 
the artist they admired so much, Whistler, died. And there is a retrospective of Whistler's work. And they were rekindled their, in their interest in Whistler's work. And so they painted works influenced by Whistler. In 1907, Streeton wanted to get married and he couldn't afford to get married. So he came out to Australia with some works and painted more scenes of Sydney Harbour. And while he was away, he lent his studio to May Vale. And she painted a very similar view of the London that Streeton had painted, looking out from his studio. So that link between Streeton and May Vale becomes very vis visible at that time and the way that the male artists had supported female artists. When we move into the next room, we see John Peter Russell. We had met him earlier as a friend of Robert's. And here we see him as an artist in his own right, an artist who had become friends with the Impressionist Alfred Sisley. And he paints a similar scene as Sisley with Mrs. Sisley sitting in the foreground. And it's miraculous that the painting that R Russell painted in one collection is the same scene that's depicted in a painting in the National Gallery's collection, and we're able to hang the two works together. While he was a student studying with Corman, Russell met Toulouse-Lautrec and met Vincent van Gogh. And he became very good friends with van Gogh. And he painted a scene of blossoms. Condor had painted blossoms all through his life, but Russell saw that what Van Gogh was doing, influenced by Japanese art, and painted a similar subject. So we see the influence of Van Gogh then. And then Russell met Monet, and he was able to help Monet. He was able to give him a man to carry Monet's equipment. You can imagine in those days, it was quite heavy. You had your paints box and your canvas and all sorts of things. And he was also able to invite Monet home to dinner because he had a wonderful wife who cooked fabulous meals. And they became friends. And Monet shared his ideas about painting with Russell and influenced the way he painted. And we're fortunate in this exhibition to be able to show a work by Monet together with the Russells and the kind of works that he influenced. Conde too had seen an exhibition of Monet's works and had written to Roberts about his fantastic images of haystacks and painted an image of haystacks himself. Another recent addition to our collection about which we are particularly excited is Iso Ray's Young Girl Etable of around 1892. Iso Ray was born in Melbourne and she began her training as an artist here at the National Gallery School before moving to France in the late 1880s to further her artistic education. This was, of course, an important step in the development of many artists at the time. She studied initially in Paris before settling ultimately on the French coast at Etaples, a small fishing village on the English Channel. There she became an important member of the artistic expatriate community, and it was there also that she painted Young Girl. This wonderfully evocative painting sees a life-size depiction of a toddler moving towards us across a sun-drenched landscape. The effects of dappled sunlight are conveyed beautifully in a manner that is absolutely characteristic of French Impressionist painting at the time. The high-keyed palette is also clearly French-influenced, that is, a palette with very little dark in it, very high content of white, which gives this extraordinary luminous effect. Ray remained in France for most of her life. She remained in France during the war, where she produced numerous sketches of soldiers and medical corps, although she was not included in Australia's first uh, contingent of war artists. 
She continued to paint until the end of her life, often works that were on similar subjects to young girls. She was particularly interested in the depiction of childhood, and in particular of these scenes of wonderful luminous landscape with figures in them. We know that this work remained in Ray's family until the end of her life. It was clearly one that she valued enormously, and it's a great privilege now to be able to add it to our collection. Displayed behind me is a group of works by British-born artist Ethel Carrick. And after studying at the Slade School of Fine Art in London, Carrick moved to France in 1905, and it was here she was influenced by French Impressionist painters Monet and Camille Pissarro, and developed her wonderfully luminous palette and depictions of French leisure scenes that she's so well known for today. In these paintings behind me, we see um, scenes of fashionable leisure. We see people promenading in French markets and beachgoers. Carrick married um, Australian artist E. Phillips Fox, and the pair of them travelled to and from Australia regularly throughout their careers and their lives. At the outbreak of the Second World War, the pair found themselves to be in Melbourne, and Fox actually passed away quite soon after this. Carrick actually adopted Melbourne um, as her home from then on and used it as a base for her many travels. Carrick would embark on solo painting expeditions um, across Africa and Europe. She actually even lived on a longboat for a time on her own in Tahiti. So she was a real independent woman, which was an incredible feat for women at the time. In this area of the exhibition, we are shown five works by Wurundjeri artist William Barrick, who was working at the turn of the century in present-day Croydon in Victoria. They provide an authoritative record of Wurundjeri culture and ceremony and are shown within this context of Australian Impressionism to really try and combat this idea that Australian Impressionism was the first school of art in this country. The Australian Impressionists were practicing at a time when a burgeoning discussion surrounding national identity was taking place. This discussion was happening within literature, poetry, and most definitely also within the arts. So we see works in this room that contain non-Indigenous Australian iconography, the Bushman, the Sheep Shearer, and the Pioneer. By positioning the work of Barrack within this space, we are reminding viewers that the Australian Impressionists were not working within a vacuum, and that although they are often referred to as this, they were not in any way the first school of Australian art. Australia already had a dynamic art tradition of over 60,000 years. These works also work to combat this narrative of Australian Impressionists defining Australian national identity. We're reminded that our country's national identity is complex and the conversation surrounding it is intense and often tragic. So while Australian Impressionism is indeed a rich and highly important moment within Australian art history, it really is just one moment within a far longer history. The final room in this exhibition is what some people will think the most popular pictures that the Australian Impressionists painted. They're the shearing pictures by Tom Roberts. They're the bush pictures by Frederick McCubbin, and there's Streeton fires on Lapstone Tunnel. But I'm hoping in this exhibition, people will see them slightly differently from how they've seen them before. They'll see that Roberts was interested in movement, perhaps having heard a lecture on Meyerbridge, the photographer, and the way Meyerbridge was interested in studying movement. And I hope they'll see that McCubbin was doing something totally different. He was, like in his Box Hill paintings, immersing himself in the landscape, but painting historical pictures, pictures of people down on his luck. And of course, the time he was painting it, because it was in the 1890s when Melbourne was going through a depression. And then Streeton is doing something totally different. He's painting a contemporary, modern subject of people trying to blast a tunnel through the mountains. And he's depicting a tiny, small figure, but a figure of a miner who had been killed through the efforts of blasting this tunnel. 
Now, this is a story of innovation, of modern activity, but it's also a story that is as relevant today as it was then. Well, that is the end of the exhibition. I do hope you enjoy it. I do hope you see lots of things for yourself, things that I haven't talked about, because there's so much for everybody to see in this exhibition. Thank you very much.